Welcome to Literary Latte, the podcast with a Southern accent on writing. I'm Linda Bouchard, and it's time for your jolt of literary inspiration. If there were a hurricane headed your way, what would you grab as you fled out the door? What do you value and consider most dear? This is a question that Mary Alice Monroe tackles in her newly released novel titled The Summer Guests. The amazing Mary Alice Monroe is with me to talk about the inspiration for this novel, about her passion for environmental issues, and for the power of stories in our lives. And we'll get to that and much more right after this from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Macintosh Bookshop and the Beaufort Bookstore, two of the best independent bookstores in the South, located in Beaufort, South Carolina. They carry books from the Civil War era, popular fiction, and everything Southern. And they carry all of the titles by guests on this show. So be sure to stop by both locations the next time you're in Beaufort, South Carolina. Now on to the show. Joining me today from Mobile, Alabama, is New York Times and USA Today bestselling author Mary Alice Monroe, who is currently on a national promotional tour for The Summer Guests, which showcases her signature style of plumbing the interior lives of her characters while weaving in environmental issues dear to her heart. In The Summer Guests, Mary Alice brings along fan favorite Beach House resident Coretta Rutledge and introduces us to the equestrian world. Here's a snapshot. As an impending hurricane approaches the southern coast, an illustrious cast of characters evacuate to a horse farm in North Carolina, where they ride out the storm together. Relationships are put to the test as they confront unresolved issues and come to terms with what is most important in life. The Summer Guests explores the complexities of these relationships and the parallels between land and life. Mary Alice Monroe is the author of more than two dozen novels and two children's books. Her best-selling novel, The Beach House, was adapted into a Hallmark Hall of Fame original movie. She is the recipient of numerous awards for her work, including the South Carolina Center for the Book Award for Fiction, the Reader's Choice Award, and she was most recently inducted into the South Carolina Literary Hall of Fame by the South Carolina Academy of Authors. Mary Alice Monroe, It is such a thrill to have you here. Welcome. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations on this book and for your induction into the uh, South Carolina Literary Hall of Fame. Well, as we say in South Carolina, that's high cotton. (laughs) Indeed. And that must have been especially satisfying for you being recognized by your peers. Very much so. In fact, I'll tell you a story. The night that I was inducted happened to be the same night that my movie, The Beach House, was on television, was being debuted. So I had to watch it because we were doing a live feed. So we were trying to figure out where to go because the hotel didn't have a um, setup. And it was in Beaufort, South Carolina. And I'm friends with Cassandra and the wife of Pat Conroy. So she said, come over to our house. So me and friends went to Pat Conroy's house. I sat in his big old Archie Bunker chair and I watched my Hall of Fame movie in his house. And underneath the TV screen on the mantle was his trophy, I guess you'd call it, for his Hallmark Hall of Fame. So let me tell you, that was quite an emotional moment. It was, I'll never forget it. You know, Mary Alice, you have this wonderful ability to blend the natural world with the emotional world in your writing. And The Summer Guests opens with the threat of a hurricane and forces your characters to examine what they treasure most in life. And an important question is posed. What should I take with me? What what do I treasure? So how did the writing process force you to examine that same question in your own life? It's interesting. Um, This particular book was somewhat autobiographical for me, where most are not. 
And in, in two ways. One is I've lived on a barrier island for over 20 years. And I have a little PTSD when it comes to hurricanes. I've lived through so many. And I've evacuated so many times. And where I used to pack stuff, you know, that I thought had value, I've changed what I put in the car. And my, what I, I've determined what I value really can't be packed other than my animals. And everything else literally is just stuff. And I think that's a metaphor for life, that when you leave, it all, it's all just stuff. And so when I, oh my goodness, it must have been two years ago for Hurricane Irma that I actually evacuated to my girlfriend's house up in North Carolina in Tryon. And what I took with me were three big dogs and five canaries. My children are gone. My husband was taking his car, but that's what I valued. And when I got up there, this was all during the time when this hurricane was wobbling in Florida from the east to west coast. Everyone was evacuating. It was a mass. The entire state was on the road. So people with horses were calling my friend saying, where can we go? Where can we go? And that's an essential question people ask when they're fleeing a natural disaster. Where can I go when the hotels are booked, when I have animals that can't get into the hotels, or I have livestock like horses? So people from Miami came with their animals, their horses, and big dogs, and she was an equestrian. People from Wilmington, uh, Wellington, Florida, they were dressage riders, came with their Olympic-level horses. And we all got up to Tryon, and we lived together, and it was a, a melting pot or a pressure cooker, in a way, for five days, where we had the threat of the hurricane out there. But inside this house, we were a bunch of women helping each other. And we were all women helping women. And it was women, dogs, horses, wine, babies. I came home and I said, I have a novel. And I thought, I have to address this in a novel, the emotional side of what is a, a climate reality. Your novels have such a strong sense of place. And the powerful backdrop, as we have talked about in this novel, is the hurricane. And it's a character in its own right. Yes, it's a character. So, uh, and it has different moods as you track it at the beginning of each chapter. Talk about the influence of that hurricane um, on the characters and the events as they unfold. Well, the metaphor of the hurricane is one that I used for the characters as well. Each one of them had an internal hurricane going on. And I think that when people are together in a family or friends are together in a, in a place where they're confined, the tensions rise as well. These people became friends. Strangers became friends. And yet the mother-daughter relationship for which there are two um, issues began to bubble up. Everything was heightened. and. I really wanted all this whirlwind internally to go on while the whirlwind was happening outside. In fact, I really wanted to title the book Whirlwind <laughs> because the horse whirlwind is a character in the novel. And this is a, a fabulous, great horse who affects everybody's life that week. And so I try to use that metaphor over and over and over again to symbolize that this is a very unstill, tumultuous time physically as well as emotionally and the characters are quirky it was i think it was the most fun characters i've ever created including kara <laughs> what usually comes first the story or the species and a second part to that mary alice is what did you learn from studying that's a horses? good question for me it's always the species comes first i don't have a story to begin with so I use my intuition, which is very strong, and we all have this capability, to tell me when it's time to write about a particular species right now. For example, I know I want to write about whales someday. It's coming. It's just that I don't have, my, I don't feel that, mm, that sense of knowing that it's time to write about it. So I felt it for horses. And I love horses. I don't think anybody in this country doesn't love a horse. We may not own a horse or go riding, but it's it's an integral part of the American culture, the horse. So 
I was up in that category. I, I'm not a professional writer at all. So I went up to do work with rescue horses. And I spent several months helping, but I didn't get the hum of the story. So it wasn't until the hurricane that I knew when I went up there and, and I was with Olympian quality horses and rescue horses and all kinds of horses. But what I was in, enamored with was I slept in the barn, in a loft over the barn. And that was my spot. <laughs> she, was, she was housing so many people. And for the first time at night, I could hear the knickers and the kicking of the stall, the communication, the <laughs> you know, and it, it to me, it was like the purring of a cat, you know, where your blood pressure goes down. And I felt connected to these animals. And in the morning, I would get up early and have my coffee with them and help feed them and brush them. And I, for the first time, had that intimate connection with horses. And I realized that they are very smart and communicative. Like when I deal with any wild animal, like a dolphin, it takes a while to learn the signals. And horses have 15 different facial expressions that you can identify. And I learned, you know, all of us want to go touch that horse right away, right? Pet them. And then they kind of rear back with their heads. And I learned that, no, you have to have a respect for their space. This is how they interact. So you go slowly and you raise your hand to the neck. You know, how do we like putting our hands, someone putting your, hi, how are you? And they bump you on the nose. That doesn't feel so good. So you learn these, these um, how to communicate with this animal who's noble and very big. And they have personalities just like any other species. And I, once I identified with them, I understood how to portray the connection that the horses have with their owners whether they're riding dressage or whether he, one character was afraid to get back on a horse because most people who ride horses professionally have a bad fall. And this one character was afraid to get back on the horse. So I had to understand that what would make him want to get back on a horse. And I hope that my experiences with the animals, like with every book I write, is authentic because I've gone through it. And I hope my reader then experiences that connection. And there's a lot of wildness in this book. Um, there's the wildness of the, the horses, the hurricane, the women. Uh, it's it's uh, the trifecta. <laughs> <laughs> of, and a lot of, of dialogue. Parties. You know, I realized <laughs> since I was juggling all these things that the best way to do it was to keep the movement through that they were talking to each other. And when I was up there, we became friends with individuals. So all these different relationships were sparking. And I think my favorite character of all of them, well, I loved the trickster. I loved the um, angel who I deliberately wanted him to be that character who was both charming and naughty. You know, you never knew what was going to come. And Gerda, who was the woman with the prosthesis, as I do with every book I write, I have experts read the book to make sure all my information is accurate. And I feel very confident that it's, it's correct. So the reader will get a glimpse of what it means to have a prosthesis. And I really think it made her, look, uh, she could be perceived as the personification of the elite, wealthy horsewoman, who's not likable at the beginning of the book. And I wanted that to be the case. But then you get to know her and her struggles and that she has a prosthesis and why she has, the agony of why she has it. It adds such dimension to her character. So by the end yes. of the book, you are on her side. And I think yes. that as an author is my job is to create characters who go through a story arc. So the readers, just like they're meeting a real person, kind of peel back the layers. Absolutely. And writing like life itself is a voyage of discovery. It really is. And in particular, I think this book, because I the whole book takes place in five days, it is everything's accelerated because of the tensions and the excitement and the worry. You know, you have the TV on. Anyone who's been through a natural disaster has that TV on 24-7. 
Even if you hear the same announcement five times, you just have to hear in case there's something new. Yeah. It's like a drone, a white noise in the background. And I kept that going in the book because people are aware that I'm safe in the mountains, but what's going on in the coast? Yes, that was a nice device. And so we're going to take a quick break, Mary Alice. And if you're just joining us, my guest is New York Times bestselling author, Mary Alice Monroe, whose book, The Summer Guests, is a story of self-discovery, redemption, and about what we hold most dear. After we take this break, we'll get to her writing life and talk about the book she's working on now. I'm Linda Bouchard, and this is Literary Latte. Hey, author, summer is just around the corner, and that means road trips and being on the go. So now is the perfect time to make your book an audiobook, portable and deliverable from Amazon, Audible, and iTunes, so your readers can take it along with them wherever their imaginations roam. Audiobooksolution.com is the answer. So get started today and give voice to your written words. Just visit audiobooksolution.com and schedule a 15-minute free call to learn more. And be sure to mention that you heard it here on Literary Latte. That's audiobooksolution.com. Let's get back to my interview with Mary Alice Monroe, whose new book, The Summer Guests, examines a philosophical question. When faced with loss and forced to leave things behind, what do we treasure most? A hurricane is the catalyst that brings very different characters together in her new novel and helps them discover what is most important. Mary Alice, you've been creating Southern-inspired stories rooted in nature since you moved to the Isle of Palms from the Midwest. And so what led you to discover the heart of your stories? Why are you so committed to crafting a story world that connects readers to nature? Well, I began, when I, as you said, when I moved to the Isle of Palms, and the first thing I did was join the Island Turtle Team. And there weren't a lot of turtles in Washington, D.C. or Chicago, so I had a lot to learn. So I began a process that I use to this day, which is I do an academic research so that I am solidly informed. The second thing I do is I talk to experts in the field. And back in the day, it was not so easy to get them to talk to me because they didn't know who I was. After 20-some years now, they appreciate that I'm bringing the message of a species information to an audience they're not reaching. People who might not know they care about a turtle or a horse or a dolphin. And the third thing I do, which is a hallmark, is I roll up my sleeves and I become a volunteer in that story world. And that's the only way that I experience for myself. If you're looking at a dolphin in the water, through my eyes, through the eyes of the character, you're looking at that dolphin through my eyes and you feel my passion. And over the years, and from that very first book, which was The Beach House, yes. I realized that it was reaching so many people to care because of the emotion of the story. And once people care, they take care. They, what can I do to help? I've got so many letters not only from the fans, but saying, I, I read your book and I volunteer, or I read your book and I donated, or I read your book and I called my mother for the first time in 10 years, or your book was there for me when my husband died and I, and I thank you. It, it, for whatever reason, that book touches my readers. That's the transcending, that's transcending the book into true parable storytelling. It, it's a moral lesson. So I realized that I had an opportunity with the beach house and the sea turtles to spread awareness. I just wanted people to know what lights out for turtles meant, or if they were on the beach and a turtle nest hatched, what to do. And that grew to become a mission to create stories that were set against some backdrop. And I know over the past 20 years that I have reached a large audience and made a difference. And I feel with climate change right now, such a, a, a reality that we have to deal with. I believe my readers now are saying, we're getting apathetic, we're getting you know fear of 
doomsday predictions. And I feel that now my role has altered to instill hope that if everyone helps and we all are in this together, that we can forestall the worst, that we can help make a difference. But never before have I felt that my books were more, or my speaking today is more a call to action. Please don't be apathetic. You can make a difference in your own personal life. Global warming is huge, but the individual action is so important. And that's where each book I write is my lighting one candle. Each book I write is a call to action. And each every reader then can choose how to act. It's personal, but it's the ramifications can be broad. So I continue to write. Yes. And one of the great geniuses of your work is that you have this arc lamp of truth throughout your novels. There's nowhere to hide in its beam. <laughs> but you <laughs> but you are not judgmental. You present uh, a situation and an issue through beautiful stories. Right. And um, that's such a nice touch. Which What's I the power of story? Yes. It, Linda, it is the power of story. I don't feel like it's my job. I'm, I entertain. I'm a storyteller. It's, and, it, and I believe in that power. And through this story, the reader gets all the information she needs to know. Because that's my job, is to do that through characterization and setting and themes. I don't want to tell my reader what to do. I don't proselytize. It's, it's, that would not be fun. That's a nonfiction. When people read my books, they want to care about the characters. Yes. They care about the lives. So I always take, for example, with this book, The, the Summer Guest, I look at what I learn, the fight or flight instinct of the horse. So what I do is I show it in the humans who are fleeing a hurricane. So I look at what I learned from the animal and I, I, the, the, the facial expressions I mentioned earlier are so pronounced in a horse. Well, I have the characters in my novel have unique facial expressions. So I don't say to the reader, oh, you know, there are 15 different uh, expressions. That's not why they're reading my book. They want to know, you know, how's this love story going to turn out? What about this mother-daughter? Are they ever going to get together? Is that daughter ever going to forgive her mother? You know, that's what they're interested in because I want them to see their own lives mirrored in the characters. I work with my husband, who's a psychiatrist, and my sister, who's a therapist. And we go over the characters. And we try to make sure that the psychological profile is absolutely real and correct. And I create, like, I won't say to someone, she's suffering from... PTSD, or in the, but I'll show the symptoms. And that's creating a real character that I, people can say, oh my gosh, I know that person. I know, I know who she is because she's real. I love writing about groups of women. I mean, in every book, the turtle team ladies, or in this case, all these women stuck in this house, you know, the mama's making the big pots of spaghetti and the baby's crying, the dogs are barking at the window, and they're all wearing jeans and dirty from the day's work, but they got that glass of wine in hand, and they're dancing to music together. I love, I love women helping women. I know you're on tour for the summer guests, and you've also published two children's picture books, and you're completing your first chapter book for middle grade children. I just finished it, yes. All right. And so, I'm very excited about that. Thank you for mentioning it. It's called The Island. Okay. And so what compelled you to get into this new genre? And, and, and what ways is writing for children different for you? First of all, it's very different as a, as a craft. I had a lot to learn. But I wrote two picture books because I wanted to show I was so annoyed when I read books for young children who believe everything that's in print is true and the writers just made mistakes. You know, they're not telling the truth about these animals. And I just felt kids would deserve better. So I, I, that's one of the reasons I use photographs as well. And, but picture books were limiting. I loved those middle grade kids, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Um, who still believed they could change the world. This is when you want to catch that inspiration. When they get older, a lot of it's interior landscape that they're interested in. And that early levels is the outer landscape. They still want to 
explore turtles. It doesn't happen quite so much when you're in your later teens. They come back to it. So I wanted to write for that age group where I could inspire them because they are the future. I wanted to give them a story to show that if you turn off your electronics, you will, and play in nature, that not only is it A, better for your brain, you know, the, the National Pediatric Association has declared this, the National Institute of Health has declared it, and my husband, the child psychiatrist, knows, turn off the electronics, limit screen time. And get those kids outdoors. And if they cry that they're bored, hey, good. Find something to do. Let your imagination go crazy. And that's what the island is. It's three children on Duvis Island, which is right outside Isle of Palms, approachable only by boat. There are no cars on the island, only golf carts. No stores, no shops, just homes. It's a wildlife sanctuary. And you have three children, a little Army brat boy, my son's a Marine, so I knew that, an army brat boy whose father was injured, an African-American boy who's very I'm a wealthy Atlanta family, and a young girl, Little Lovey, from my Beach House series. Mm -hmm. They're all 10 and 11 years old, and they're unlikely friends. They would not have been friends had they were they in school together. But they were thrown together on an island, and they became friends because, and they learned to discover each other, but also the wildlife brought them together. And of course, there are turtles. <laughs> there are turtles. <laughs> of course, there are. So that comes out in 2020. So, it's the first mm -hmm. in the series. I think there will be additional books following with the same characters. And this will be with Aladdin books at Simon & Schuster. So it's a departure for me. I still will focus on my novels. I suspect there will be another Beach House book at some point because I feel very blessed to have a series that is as beloved as that one is. People really care about the characters, which is why putting Kara Rutledge into this new book, she filled the role I needed for someone in the book. So I thought, why not Kara? Why not let my readers? They love that when I surprise them that way. But I do think another Beach House book will come down the pike. Mm. So how has your friendship with other authors helped you become a better writer, Mary Alice? Well, there's two different areas to answer that question. One, emotionally, is the sense of a tribe that we support one another, like Mary Kay Andrews' book is out this summer, Patty Henry's book is out this summer, Nancy Thayer's book is out this summer, Dottie Frank's book is out this summer. I mean, we, have, we know each other. And so we say, hey, good luck with that. You know, there's cream rises to the top and there's a lot of room. Mm -hmm. We call each other. Patty and Mary Kay and I get together frequently to brainstorm our books. Okay. And we've counted on each other to just come up with, we trust each other. And that's at the brainstorm, brainstorm area, not the editing. As far as um, the, the emotional too, I have to say being alone as a, with a, your work is lonely business. I spend intense hours in front of the computer by myself. And I sometimes just call up Patty or I call someone up and I say, you know, how's it going? Or just today, I got an email from Patty Henry. Hey, aren't you taking off? On Thursday, we keep tabs on one another to make sure we're okay. Mm, right. That's nice that you champion each other. Because well, I it think is, it, it is it's so important. solitary. It's a solitary endeavor. You spend monkish hours, you know, writing. Uh, you do need that feedback. And you lose touch. Mm. You know, when you're working that hard or you're on the road, those long hours of driving between, you know, home and the event is often when we call each other mm -hmm. to catch up. You know, where are you off to now? What's going on? Or if we have concerns, you know, about our bus the business side, who do you trust that you can give those personal details? It's your best friend who knows what you're going through. So I think it's very important for all women to have that best friend who you can count on when the chips are, who you can call when a hurricane comes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That intimate friend. Yes. 
If you could tell your younger writing self anything, what would it be? And have you become the writer you dreamed you'd be? Wow, the last question is very hard to answer. Um, The young Mary Alice pretty much has done everything that I would advise a young writer to do. I have, and the bottom line is work hard. I'm giving the commencement address I told you to Pfeiffer University this weekend. And I have given this a lot of thought. And what I'm telling them is that when you leave school, you're just beginning your education. And that the life education are the most profound, those lessons to pay attention. That one of the things that I would tell a young writer, but I tell everybody, no matter what your career path is, I said, look to your left and look to your right. In order to succeed, you have to be willing to work harder than the person at your left or your right. I talked to five experts, and I mean people who are top of their careers and banking, entrepreneur, a Marine, who's a general. Every one of them basically said the same thing. Tell them to work hard because without it, you won't, you'll just float along. I, and I think that's what I did my entire career as a writer. I always studied hard. I joined conferences. I volunteered. I read books and books. I was always seeking ways to improve my craft. I was a writer, but I wanted to be a better writer. So to answer your final question, I look back on my body of work. And I know that I've achieved 20 years, 24 books to make a statement of awareness for wildlife. But with each book, I just thought, I just can write the best book that I can. And so in that that sense, I succeeded. I just did the best book that I could. And I believe for the next book, I'm going to take a little, I'm slowing down a little bit just because I want, I can you know, but I still will write the best book that I can right now. Mm, that is so powerful. You know, get, mm. you can't promise more than that if you give it your best. You know, I and I will. And you do. <laughs> Thank you. My guest has been Mary Alice Monroe, her novel. The Summer Guests is published by Gallery Books, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. Her book is available at your favorite bookseller, and you'll find a link to her book in Amazon in the show notes. Mary Alice is currently on a national book tour, and you'll find a link to her website in the show notes as well, where you can follow her and discover more about her tour dates. Mary Alice Monroe, thank you so much for writing the summer guests and for creating awareness of the natural world through your writing. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure, Linda. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your tribe and be sure to go to Apple Podcasts to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. Join me next time for another Southern Laced Literary Conversation. You've been listening to Literary Latte with Linda Bouchard. For more information, visit bookingauthorsinc with a K.com.